very good evening to you all. If you have your Bibles, please attend with me to the book of Acts. Acts chapter 2, verse 42. For the sake of context, I would read from this 37. Um, please go and get me my spectacles in the car. These are there. Verse 37. When the people heard this, that is after Peter's preaching, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the other apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? Peter replied, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins. And you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The promise is for you and your children, and for all who are far off. For all whom the Lord our God will call. With many other words he warned them and he pleaded with them, save yourselves from this corrupt generation. Those who accept his message were baptized. Those who accepted his message were baptized. And about 3,000 were added to their number that day. Verse 44. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possession to giving to anyone who had need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. Well, the passage of scripture we have read draws our attention to what would be termed the early church, the church that was founded on the day of Pentecost. And at this moment, the Bible brings to our attention the fact that Jesus Christ has just ascended and has returned to the Father, and he has told the church to tarry for a period of time in uh, Jerusalem, which they have been gathered together in the upper room, and days after the Lord had been ascended into heaven, the Holy Spirit came down on the day of Pentecost. And the church, in a practical sense, was evidenced by the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, by the signs and wonders that happened, and thereupon we have the first sermon preached. A clear fulfillment of the words of Christ that I will build my church. And after the apostle Peter preaches at that moment, he then indicates to them towards the end of his sermon, that's a passage we have read, when they have heard, and the Bible says they were cut to the heart, and now they are asking questions, what shall we do, brethren? Where shall we go? And he tells them to turn to Christ in repentance. The Bible goes on to tell us that a number of people repented. They called upon the Lord in that day or on that day and we are told the number was over or about 3,000 were added to their number meaning they were added to the church the Bible tells us of the 120 who were gathered upstairs and now we are having over 3,000 people that are being added and you can imagine 
that the church immediately after the, or on the day of Pentecost, after Peter's preaching, the numbers have swelled. Somebody has argued, which I think I would agree with, that actually, though the Bible refers to 120 in the upper room, there were more than 120 in the gatherings of the church, except that the time of the Holy Spirit happened when there's only 120. The church was far bigger than 120 at the time of Christ. And here we are having about 3,000 people added. Now, if you think of 3,000, you are definitely thinking way beyond this room. And how are the apostles going to ensure that 3,000 plus members or believers who have come around the name of Christ or God's word are going to be kept united? If only our numbers, our membership here is only 127 members, plus those who come regularly, we are not as united and we have a good number of frictions here and there. How much more would we experience if we have a membership over 3,000? It would be definitely beyond our ability to maintain that unity. And so the early church had to go through a process that would ensure that the believers remain united, they remain together, they are able to share their bread together and remain united. It doesn't take long, it's only in chapter 4, going chapter 6, that there's going to be a problem among the women in the church. And due to that fight that these Hellenists or the, the, the members of the church who have a Greek background versus the members of the church who are Jewish are going to have a very sharp friction between the two of them and deacons, the deacon ministry is going to be born out of that. But at this moment, the elders or the apostles have a responsibility. And the Bible categorically tells us what's going to happen there beginning at verse 42. I want you to observe four things, but I will focus only on one. Observe with me. The Bible says they devoted, that's the idea of being committed and having their lives engaged with what's going to be happening. They devoted themselves to the apostles teaching and fellowship. Following to that, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. So the Bible brings four things right there in verse 2 that are very important for us to really appreciate. Number one, it says they were devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching implying that there was a certain sense and knowledge among the apostles and the amount of information that they had to continually being brought to the church. Basically, it is the faith. Basically, it is the gospel. The gospel is the very message of Christ that God uses to save us. The gospel is the very message of Christ that God uses to keep us saved. It is the very message of, God, of Christ that will eventually usher us into that time of consummation. And so the gospel has been preached by Peter and men have been saved. The apostles still keep the gospel and continue teaching it that men may continue to grow and be sanctified. To give and to use perhaps a word that you and I would relate to easily on this one is basically the apostles' doctrine the doctrines of the Christian faith. The word doctrine is nothing any greater than the word teaching, the teaching of the Christian faith. The very thing that Paul tells Timothy when he tells, them, he tells him that this is what the gospel is. Christ was born. He was crucified. He died. He rose on the third day and he ascended into heaven. That is the fundamental element of the gospel. And the apostles are going to be teaching. By the way, they don't have the New Testament. They just have the Old Testament at this time. And so the apostles' teaching is going to be spent on demonstrating this Christ based on what the Old Testament has said. More so based on what God has revealed to them in the last three years that they've been with Jesus. Furthermore, what God the Holy Spirit has now begun to reveal to them 
as Christ has ascended into heaven and the Spirit himself is among them. And that is what's happening. The gospel is being taught. The apostles' doctrine or teaching is being unfolded before them. But second to that, he tells us to fellowship. To fellowship. Those of you who were around, I think, a couple of weeks ago, we really did make mention of this. The idea of believers coming together. This word fellowship is not just what we practice on Sundays. You know, we love that moment of fellowship, right? I enjoy it a lot, to stand at the door and to greet everyone and then to see everybody in the pockets that we, we come up with and stand under the trees and fellowship. Now, that doesn't mean it's anything wrong. It's beautiful. By the way, never stop doing that. In fact, if we come out of church, all you do is just hello and you jump into your car and two, three of us notice, we'll come to you and say, what's happening, brother? Finish to all of you. You know, we want to have fellowship. We know everybody's busy and everybody has no time. Everybody's running for this and that. But yet at the same time, just to pull out a little time, and spend with one another is a great blessing. But you see, the fellowship here talked about is both embracing what we do, but even going beyond that. It is a kind of fellowship that we deliberately and increasingly continue to practice where I am spending quality time with a brother, with a sister, my family, with that family, and we are continually spending our time together around the name of Christ and also around our needs. Unfortunately, we are in a time where when we use fellowship, it is so limiting in our thinking. At times it is always with the idea that when we come together, the two of us or three of us, we must make sure we sing a hymn. And after we sing a hymn, we have to discuss doctrine. And after we finish discussing doctrine, we must have a cup of tea. Then we've had fellowship. But I think the fellowship that here is talked about by, these, by the apostle here is the kind of fellowship that goes beyond just a mere order of a service. When we are the two of us, we have a small church, the three of us a small church. Our Bible study groups have become little small church services. Our fellowship in house groups as a result of our thinking and practice, they've also ended up becoming a small church service. I think fellowship has more to do with a heart touching another heart. It has more to do with how the inner man, by the hand of God, is affecting the other inner man and vice versa. The Bible says the early church spent time fellowship. It was not only the unit that they were experiencing was not only a product of the apostles' teaching, but also of fellowship. And there are two more things I'll quickly mention. The breaking of bread and to prayer. Well, the breaking of bread here uh, is quite debatable. Other theologians have uh, quickly concluded that this is actually the communion service that we have. And others have said, no, 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 it's not a communion service. It is actually a cultural practice of their time that was adopted into the church. Meaning, they would come together by their very historical uh, practice in their religion, in Judaism. The gatherings would have a moment where they would eat together. The phrase breaking bread, I know we've adopted it to use in terms of communion because of the concept that Jesus broke bread. And so we use that phrase, breaking bread. But in its use here in art, the writer is not thinking the way we are thinking today. It's us who are calling communion breaking bread after the activity of Christ when he broke bread. But here the author is not talking about the concept of communion. He's talking about a certain meal that they would have and they would break bread from house to house, or they would spend their time together. you find it in verse 46. Forgive me, I don't have my spectacles, so 46 looks like 48. But let me read it. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread 
in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts. That's the concept. It is not that they were having communion from one house to another in terms of observing the, the, the communion table, but it is the idea of family meals that they were enjoying and having together as Christians. That is the word here, breaking bread, that is used twice in 42 and in 46. And so the Bible is basically saying the communion or the coming together or the continuous assembly of the brethren, whether two or three or whether in this gathering was the activity and the practice of the early church. Their assembly, or rather their communion, was not restricted to formal meetings of the local church. They were having activities going on from house to house. It was a lifestyle that they had adopted now that we are in Christ and we are waiting for the coming of Christ and the wonders that God the Holy Spirit is doing among us. We are this new family of God and we must maintain the unit as a family of God. That oneness must continue among us. And so we are not restricted to only a Sunday morning service, which of course a Sunday morning or a Sunday or a Lord's Day is dedicated to the worship of God. And that's why on that particular day we'll be careful with the things that we do. But we will still meet to continue being in Christ around fellowship meals. And from house to house, they were breaking bread. It is from that concept that we later draw our arrangement of our local church into house groups or into house to house fellowship. And we learn from the early church. Let me mention one more and then we go back, therefore, to this concept. He says, and to prayer. Well, the early church was sold out when it came to the activities of prayer. I am reminded every time I come to the idea of the early church praying, which of course you would be able to see almost throughout or much of the book of Acts, how the early church was so engaged in prayer. Even to call upon prayer meetings and overnight prayer meetings, Peter and John are in prison, the church is praying. Paul and Silas are in prison, the, the church is praying. Over and above are many other events the church is praying. You see, the idea of prayer demonstrated or demonstrates that the early church was so committed or devoted to their dependence on God, they ensured that there is no single moment or time when it is about them and what they can do and what they can say. It is all about God. You know, at times I tend to imagine what sort of experience these brethren were having. That they would be praying for Peter to the point that God answers the prayer. Remember when God takes Peter out of jail? James has just been beheaded. The whole world is celebrating that James has been beheaded. Herod is happy, or rather the emperor is happy and says, oh, so you mean this is pleasing that the leader of the Christian, in fact, they never called it the Christian, they called it the way. The leader of the way has been beheaded and everybody is celebrating. This is a good thing. Therefore, let's get the other two leaders. And so James, Peter, and John are being seen as the leaders of the church or they are standing taller among the apostles. And so James, the brother to John, has just been beheaded. And so the emperor said, then arrest Peter and John. And so they are also arrested. And they are looking forward to do the same to them. But God sets them free in the night. And Peter comes to where they are praying at John Mark's home, John Mark's mother. And when they, he shows up, the young lady opens the door. She is overwhelmed by God's answer to prayer. She looks at Peter and she's surprised. Instead of opening and letting him in, she closes and runs back in the house to say, Peter is at the door. Okay, he's at the door. He's been set free. Why didn't you let him in? And it is while a prayer meeting is going on, while there is heavy intercession going on. 
me pause for a moment. Dear friends, that's a great challenge for us as believers today. How much are we praying? And how much are we praying not in terms of merely formal prayer meetings? But I look, for, I look forward to a time that you and I can pray spontaneously. One of my daughters was telling me of a church visit she did or church she was going to and she said we were having evening service and one man came over to share their missionary work and after they finished sharing their missionary work the pastor stood up and said well it's time we went into prayer for what this missionary friend has said and instantly the church was divided into a prayer time and they went into groups and they began to pray and I said, that's what we should be. We shouldn't wait for Thursday prayer meeting. It must be spontaneous. We should be able to say, this is the situation. Let's pause and pray. Now I know we are a community that upholds a certain orderly form. And to be breaking down that order at times is perceived as sinful. And uh, privately, some elders are even called and say, no, 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 I finish for you, I'm going to be there. And all kinds of things would be said. But you see what? That's the early church. The early church was breathing prayer. They would gather to pray. They would call upon the saints to pray. They would cry to the Lord as individuals, as collective or collective. The history of the church is known for prayer. That at times people would be said they would meet to pray at a very awkward time. I remember reading uh, the biography of Spurgeon and his love for prayer. The story goes that he was on a train traveling from London to France or to Paris because Spurgeon had an health, a health problem. And so for every year he would spend two to three months of his life in France. Because whenever the weather changed in England, his health would kick in, and so he could not live well. So he would always migrate for three, two to three months every year until the season changes in London, then he goes back. And while he's in France, he would write sermons that he would send back to the church while in France for that period of time. So one day he's traveling on the train from London going to France. And the story goes that Spurgeon was very humorous. And so everybody knew when he's on the train, they, he was a very popular man. And so Mr. Spurgeon is on the train. And everybody wants to ride in that truck. So many will come in and it will be packed. And they want to hear Spurgeon say something. And he was very humorous. And so he would pass on jokes. He would tell stories. And the whole place is laughing, enjoying the presence of Mr. Spurgeon. And the biographer goes and says, then instantly Spurgeon would be very quiet. And everybody would say, what's going on? And they'll say, it's time to pray. And they would all be quiet, bow the knee, and Spurgeon begins to pray for 30 minutes or one hour. And they would say, he's very praying, because as though we are listening to him teach us God's word. What a glorious testimony. But then let's go back to the purpose for which we want to spend our time on. And this is the idea of fellowship and the breaking of bread. These two words in our church practice, therefore, we gather around in what we call house groups and learn from there. Because in our house groups, it is intended that we will be able to practice fellowship and perhaps breaking of bread. Um, a week or two ago, I said it, and I said it again this, this morning, that uh, to be a Baptist, there must be a meal around. And my brother had expressed, Pastor, what doctrine are you teaching us? And uh, we laughed about it. He said, look, it's not a new doctrine. It's basically our mind on fellowship, that when we meet as Baptists, we baptize ourselves not only in God's word, but also in something to eat. We break bread. And so this is the idea of breaking bread. 
the early church would gather around to do a number of things. Uh, we would go through the whole Bible to see quite a number of things. But on a practical side, there are a number of activities that the early church would be doing. Number one, they would gather to fellowship. Number two, they would gather to break bread. Number three, they would gather, that is in the house groups, they would gather to pray. Number four, the early church was actually born from house. The early churches or local churches were actually born from efforts of house groups. The church in Philippi was born in Lydia's home. The church in, in uh, Corinth was born from Priscilla and Aquila's home. And many other churches are being born when they have gathered in a home and for a particular time, a church is born. Philemon tells us, the elder Philemon, who's reminded by Paul to take in a, um, the young man who had run away, and he greets him and says, the church that gathers in your home. So the elder Philemon had a church that gathered in his home. And so there is this very aspect that permeates the early church, the gathering of the saints together. And when we come to our time, we maintain that concept. And we say, what should we as house groups be doing? Should we meet every once a week? And all we do is the apostles' teaching. Is that the practical definition, biblically, of what our house groups should be doing? And that brings us to the subject that I would like us to spend time on. And that is the practical elements of our house groups. What are we supposed to be doing? And this is our prayer and discussion among the elders, that we really need to rethink and we really need to begin to say, as house groups, what are we doing? Why do we exist? What do we exist for? And so here are some examples that are very paramount that you must begin to think about. And sooner than later, when January kicks off, you are able to practice. Number one, first and foremost, in terms of our assembly, we as a church, for the purpose of organization and for the purpose of management of our house groups, we deliberately have chosen and set it that we should meet every Tuesday, once every week. There are certain house groups that, that is another local churches, who meet once every two weeks, others would meet once every month. Uh, it, it varies from one local church to the other. There is no uh, cast in stone uh, rule, except a local church puts it in their constitution, like we have here. Constitutionally, we have said we'll meet once a week as a house group, and we'll meet uh, for such a period of time. A house group, therefore, apart from that, Secondly, it is a time that the church has little moments or short moments in the week or after a certain period to gather around each other, to gather around the name of Christ with each other. And a number of activities are expected to be done in that house group. Bible study or studying God's word is but one of the many things that a house group would be doing or should be doing. A house group can and should gather for a prayer time. So for example, if this Nyumbayanga house group said, you know what, we as a house group, we need to meet for prayer once every month and we'll do our prayer time from church on Saturday at 06 or 07. The church, that house group can organize themselves and on a, on a particular Saturday come and meet here for prayer. Or they can say, no, in terms of prayer meeting, we'll meet in brother so-and-so and sister so-and-so's home and that is where we will have our prayer meeting. The house group should be free to do that because it's part of the many things that the house group is doing to make sure that they are working together. The house group may say, well, for us as a house group, to increase our oneness, we want to 
take a time out and go for a fellowship moment. So we as a house group, we are taking a trip to Chilanga or we are taking a trip to Ibex here, wherever they say, and we are going to meet there as a house group and spend a time of fellowship. A house group must be able to say, we will have, for example, uh, a social moment, a, a fellowship social moment, and we are going to gather at the Kunga's backyard and play some games and just enjoy a time with each other, and at the end of it day, we will have a cup of juice. A fellowship house group should be able to do that. A group should be able to say, this week we will meet and just take a walk as a house group. And during our walk, we want to ensure that we give out tracts as we go. And we just want to perceive it as a walk on such, such a road going to Jerusalem. And we take up that time, and for the next time, we meet as a house group and simply take a long walk to the end of the road, give out flyers, even possibly knock on people's doors and come back. With that in mind, a fellowship group must be able, a house group must be able to put together an evangelistic effort. We say, you know what, we, the house group that is based in Yumbayanga, or that is based in this area, we see the need to evangelize our community. And this is our evangelistic program as a house group. Once a month, we will not gather for this particular event, or once a month, we will gather specifically to go and knock on doors, or to go at the bus stop, or to go at the market and just speak to people about Jesus Christ. That must be the effort of an event of, of a house group. Talking on evangelism, we should be able, as a house group, to say, for example, we have noticed in Yumbayanga market, there are a lot of uh, troubled souls that are ever playing around Yumbayanga. If you've been to Yumbayanga market, and if you've been there, you may have experienced. You can tell boys are on drugs. They drink almost all the other time. And it's one of the most difficult places for us to evangelize, right? You know, at times we think the unreached people group are supposed to be the Arabs. And we think of the Arabs and say, you know, those are very unreached people. We don't know how to reach them. We don't know what to do. If they sent me as a missionary to the Arab community, hey, they behead there, I can't go there. Those are difficult to reach. But did you know that we have the unreached just under our nose, right at the market? Have you ever thought about it? What are we doing about it? Are we waiting for an announcement from the pulpit to say, uh, evangelism, Nyumbayanga market, attack, let's go? No. While that is possible and that should be, as a house group, those are some of the things we begin to organize and simply say, you know what, let's begin an outreach at the market. You know, there are a lot of people there that are troubled souls. Boys, young men, young women are drinking, are, are hurting their souls. Let's, let's start something. It's going to be difficult at the beginning, but let's just begin by giving out tracts. And you see the joy with the Zambian community when you bring something to read. Even one who doesn't know how to read, they take them, eh? And they want to pretend as if, oh, hey. but they don't even know what, what is written on there. And at times then they will hold it and they say, Manje kai, kamban, sonje kambat And those are doors that begin to open. And those are opportunities that we as a house group begin to enjoy the joy and the blessing that the gospel is being taken to that marketplace. Some people, by the way, they will get saved and never come to our church. They will never. They may never knock on that door. They may never even know evangel. But God will take them to a place where he wants them to be shepherded and to grow. It's not our intention just to leave uh, 
new believers and disciples scattered everywhere. That's not the concept of the Bible. He says, teach them that they, when they are saved, oh, bring the gospel when they are saved, teach them, keep them, bring them in the church. But in the event that the Lord Jesus Christ doesn't bring them to us and yet he saves them, we remain trusting and very confidently so that God will then take them to a place where they need to somebody to shepherd them. And so we participate in both sowing the seed and watering and seeing God himself give the increase. Those are opportunities, practical opportunities that house group we should be able to do. We should be able to say, you know what, this week or next week on Tuesday, let's meet. And when we meet Nyumbayanga, if we're meeting at the Nkalamos, we'll meet just for five minutes to pray. And we are just going to walk from that market to the end of the road and back. And whoever you can, trusting the Lord, you will open an opportunity two on one and speak the gospel. Speak the gospel. Speak the gospel. We can do that once a month. We can do that once every two months, whatever the period is. But as a house group, we have planned to do something like that. Another thing that is very practical that we can do is adopt a project. Adopt a project. Away from church, we as a house group can say, you know what? There is a word. You know this, um, the Bowlen Clinic, this way, this way, but the Bowlen Clinic, which is just right at the beginning of Bowlen there. There is a maternity ward. There was a time when Nyumbayanga House Group made an effort to donate some particular items to that, um, that ward. Do you remember Nyumbayanga House Group? We did that once. Two years, three years, four years ago. But here's the joy. We can say we as a house group are going to permanently adopt a particular word in the hospital. And we will walk into that place, ask some of the needs that are there, an opportunity for us to exercise mercy to the people in there. We will probably buy a Bible, and every person we hear that there is a new person that has come in the ward will have a Bible to go and give them. We will go there and in the quietness, with the permission of the hospital, Pray for those people in that ward. We don't need to go and stand in the ward and say, please, everybody bow down. We are now going to pray for this ward. We may not do that. We may go on the bed and pray one-on-one. -on -one. It may not happen today because of COVID, but we can go there and easily tell the doctors, today is our prayer day. We will just sit in this corner. Please give us the names of your patients, and we want to pray for them one after the other. And we are seated in that hospital wing, and we are just on the corner, and we are praying for those. Yes, we can do that at home, but it communicates the very gospel as well when people are saying, those people are praying for this. That can be done, should be done by a house group on a practical sense. Um, we can also think of the needy children. There is an orphanage in Chilenje which has very troubled little children. There is another orphanage, should be in Jack Compound, where um, the owner of the orphanage recently died, and the children are very vulnerable. Now, I know about that because the running group that I participate in, we did adopt that orphanage, and once every year during this Christmas, there are donations, and the running group uh, takes staff to that, but the owner has died. And now these children, majority of them are handicapped. And there is nobody, um, we will know this because there will be a donation going on this month, who has taken over. But that's an opportunity for us to show mercy. It is exciting to see runners go there and without the knowledge of Christ want to show mercy. How much more we will know Christ that would go into such an environment and says, this, is, this orphanage, we've adopted it. We have adopted it, not that it belongs to us. We are just coming along with the owners and we've taken just a little portion of it and we are preoccupied with that activity. We will be there once a month. If there are such needs, we want these needs to be done. 
and every day we will come and bring you these following needs. And we will gather and pray and raise the money as a house group and ask each other and in our areas of influence, say, can you bring this, can you bring this? And let's always make sure that those children are having something. So for example, we'd say, your children, we know you are struggling, we've adopted you, we will take responsibility of breakfast. We'll make sure that every month we raise 50 kg of samp, samp, eh? umusaku, 50 kg of umusaku, and we'll also raise 2 kg of pounded groundnuts. And we've adopted this orphanage. Our responsibility to this orphanage is breakfast. January to December, owners of the orphanage, our participation is to make sure these children have breakfast. That will be a great blessing. They may not dress well, they may not sleep well, but they have a healthy meal once a month. And a house group should be able to do that. Are we together? At least you can do this or this. And that's the practicality of house groups. Not to blow any horn, but there was a time I walked to the police post here. You know our police post. Um, I stopped doing it, not out of anything, but I just dropped the ball. But I went to them because we did it in Kitwe, so I thought, let me do it here as well. In Kitwe, we, with Faith Baptist, we did work on the police post, the container, and on a monthly basis, I was the one driving there to take two rims of paper and a pack of ball pens. You know how much the police want paper and pen, eh? They love it. Now, obviously, some of them steal it, pack it in their pockets. But for us, that was our ministry to that. So every month, I would go drop that at that place. So I went to this police post. I said, ah, this would be a good idea to do. And so I went, I talked to the police. They said, yeah, yeah. Ah, boss, you have no idea how much paper we need and pen. So a few trips down the road, I stopped. Um, like I said, there was no reason for me stopping. I just dropped the ball. It was something perhaps that was no longer preoccupying my mind. But probably if it was a collective effort, it would have been something like somebody would say, Pastor, aren't we going? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, brother, aren't we going? Oh, yeah, yeah. And we have a ministry. And not just an individual. It's good to have an individual effort in ministry as the Lord has gifted you and called you. But this evening I'm talking about collectively as a house group. That's an opportunity. When you go to these police posts, if you've been there before, it's, it's horrible in terms of toilets. It's unbearable. You begin to say, what's going on with the inmates? We've picked a, a, a few individuals here whom we said, let's take them there. And the police will say, no, we can't keep them. Please take them to Woodlands because Pano toilet, yeah, the problem. You know, we have no toilet. That's an opportunity for us, you know. How can we do ministry? Let's go, let's go to that police post as a house group. Let's build a toilet. Let's see what's there. If it's a cistern and the whole system that's broken, how much does that cost? Cheapest to be how much in town? Those of us who go to Westgate. 800 kwacha? Most expensive, 1,500? Can you imagine we go and buy a system for that police post as a house group, if we went for the cheapest to buy at 800, if we went for an average 1,200, we put money together, we buy a bag of cement, we call a plumber, he gets on site, cleans it up, puts it in place. That's ministry. And as a house group, we'll walk away saying, we've ministered to those people. Tomorrow, if we go and take the gospel to those policemen, do you think they'll refuse? They would want to listen. If these people are able to do this for inmates, we would love to listen to what they have that has changed their hearts. You know, that is all part of the practical efforts that as house groups we can and we should be doing. Another practical example is we can easily, very easily, plan out in such a way we put a calendar as a house group and identify unique activities every other week 
or at the end of every other month. And so, for example, do, have you noticed the, our children, our young children, how less we, excuse me, how less we have them participating in our house group meetings? Have you ever noticed that? Because it's Bible studies, at times we don't even pick them. Now, for good reasons, probably you always come from the office and go straight to the Bible study. Home is very far. A unique arrangement here in Lusaka. You live in Ibex. Your church is in Nyumbayanga. You work from 10 miles. And so just to work around to bring everybody to a house group which is in Kawata doesn't seem to work. And so you end up at that house group always alone. But if we as a house group began to say, how can we bring this unity of the church in a holistic sense in the whole home? Those who have little children, how can the children feel that yes, today is Tuesday, we are going for house group? And so we begin to think through how the children can be incorporated. So we can say, we are going to dedicate one Tuesday to children. On that particular day, all of us as adults are going to sit back and help the children learn a topic. Or we are going to come with board games. And we are going to have the board games here. And we as parents collectively are going to play the board games with our children. It would be very exciting to see El Dachingambu on his knees on a board game with a two or three year old child from another home and they are playing drafts. That will be a powerful ministry to that child. And they will never forget that. And two, three, four other mothers, they are seated with two, three, four girls and they are playing, I don't know what name is that. Those of you who, oh yeah, Balpunga, you are there, you are my dictionary. What is Ichienga in English? <laughs> huh? Does anybody know it in English? It's typical, eh? There's no English. Ichiato. Huh? Yes, what is it? Ichiato. Yeah, no, but in English. Okay. Now, a lot of our children don't know it, but I can bet you almost all the mothers here know it. Right? And you, majority of you played it. Have we passed it on to our children? We probably haven't. And uh, after my generation or the next generation after me, probably that will be a sport that will never be known. You get the point. But if we were to put the stones and draw around the circle there, and there he seated Vanankalamu casting the stone, Vavala, five stones and four six to Awera Kamokashara. The kids say, wow. And they are trying it on their own and the stones are falling on their heads and some of them cry, but you see they learn and they say, oh, so this was, obviously today's children will be saying, is there an app for it? What's the app? Okay, they want to play it on an app and there's no app for it. But that is a practical activity that a house group is involved in. And you're drawing those children in that house group. They are now feeling part of the church. Come up with lessons. Come up with memory verse projects for the children. Do a number of things. I have no list of those. But my point is, let's come out of this tradition that we have built to think house group is only to be like a mini church. If we say house group, then we are simply saying, come with a hymn book and a Bible, and then we hear somebody teaches, teach us. I want to suggest to you that we are there today, not because that's the most holy thing to do in a house fellowship, but it's because we are lazy to adventure many other things that would grow us into fellowship. And because of that laziness, we have defaulted into this activity because it somehow meets the need. But truly speaking, if we would be 
very ministry oriented. We would go beyond merely meeting every other Sunday, every other Tuesday, just for a Bible study. And I repeat that so that it can probably sink more. But the reason why we simply think a house fellowship is all about a hymn book and a Bible, a song and a teaching, and we think that's the most holiest thing to do, it's because we have been lazy in being more creative and thinking of many other things that we should be doing. And because of that laziness, we've defaulted to this kind of sin. And we are encouraging the church that we need to come out of that. And we need to make the fellowship, uh, the house group, more of a fellowship, a breaking of bread place, a heart-to-heart -heart at, at, uh, affecting each other. We are able to say as a house group and say, look, we are going to start a discipleship uh, activity within the house group. So we are going to divide in twos. Panta will take Michael. Another elderly person will take that child. And the two of you, we expect communication with each other during the week over this topic. And when that Tuesday meeting comes, we expect Michael to give a report about what he's been learning from Panta. And Vachpanta is expected to give a report on what he has come to discover about this young life called Michael. It'll be exciting. And there we discover that uh, the one that the young person was with is Professor Woa, and he's just told him how he played football barefooted, and how with his bare foot he was able to hold the ball. And so he physically and practically demonstrates it when they're the two of them, removes his shoe and shows him. And now Michael is able to say, you know, And that in itself is a life touching a life. And from the, from the house group, such things will be born. And relationships will be built. And the unity of the church would be experienced and felt. And all of a sudden, because of that arrangement, Basim Chimba is on that program, and he knows very well that he needs to pick that young man, and they are going to go at the mall, or they are just going to go to a place and just pour his life into that, because he's accountable to that relationship. Or there is going to be uh, Auntie Elizabeth Chwoboka, and she has a responsibility over that young child, and they are going to meet and they're going to talk about this and that. They're going to pray. They're going to interact. And then when we come to meet, we're going to share the joys and the blessings that we're experiencing. We may say the reporting day will be at the month end from these uh, discipleship efforts. And come month end, the house group will meet on a Saturday at Eldam Gala's house. And at that time, we'll have a cup of tea and a cupcake and all of us will give a report or we'll talk about the time we've had in the week, in the month. And then when that is over, we'll swap. This elderly person will take this young person and this mother will take this young lady and everyone will swap and we start all over again for that month. And at the month end again, we'll meet over such a person at such a house for such a talk. All I'm saying is our arrangement, if we are going to experience what the early church experienced, we must think outside the box of the traditions that we have created and have thought that this box is actually the holiest way. And I'm suggesting to us that actually what we may have thought and created as the holiest way to do it is actually born out of our lack of the initiative to think beyond that kind of practice. When I visited the U.S. some time back, one of the things I experienced was to go at a house group. Now, one house group said, the preacher, I preached on Sunday, and they said, we'd like the preacher to come to our house group on a Wednesday. 
So it was exciting. I said, okay, let me have an opportunity to this house group. In fact, I went to two house groups. One house group told me in advance. They said, when you come on Wednesday, it is our cuisine day. We want, on our cuisine day, we have one person teach us a new meal. Now, when I was preaching, or well, part of my introduction of my family and myself, I talked about I like cooking. So that house group head, and quickly they told the elders, the speaker, we want him in our house group, and we, on our cuisine day, we want him to come and teach us how to cook a particular African meal. And they told me that, and I was excited. I'll tell you why. Because when I was going to the US, something that I didn't want to do, which my wife, sorry my wife, forced on me, was to carry bags of finkubala to take to particular friends in the US. I just couldn't stand that. I tried to say, look, we can't, look, this and that, this and that, no, we have to. We finally went and uh, silver catering packed for us in a exportable way. So I had a bag of, I really felt like I'm coming from the village, you know, with the finkubala in the bag. So I get to America. In fact, the fun started at the border, uh, uh, at the airport in America. Uh, when the attendant at the immigration said, are you carrying any food? And I said, yes. And she looked at me and said, fresh food? I said, no, dry food. Now, you know that Kalitu window, so we're looking at each other. No, dry food. Then she said, what food? I said, caterpillars. So she literally moved backwards, looked at me like, this guy is weird. She took my passport and stamped quickly, closed it, and gave it back to me. She thought I was joking, but I was real, <laughs> okay? So now with the house group, they said, I'm going, to, and I was excited. So I took one pack from what my wife had told me to go and deliver to particular friends. And I came with it on Tuesday, on Wednesday. And I said, I want to teach you how to cook caterpillars. Oh, you would have seen the house. The bazungus could not, what, caterpillars? The wives were, hey. the men were, saying, yeah, let's, let's taste this African food. And so I opened it. They were examining one caterpillar after the other. <laughs> Are they moving? Are they alive? I said, no, they are dead and dry. So that was what we did as a house group. I cooked caterpillar in this kitchen. And I opened, poured them back and forth, fried them. And after I finished, I said, now it's time to test. So only two, three were very courageous who came because they like eating stuff from everywhere. They tried. They were excited. If you guys are not eating, we eat everything alone. So all the women refused. I went around. I said, just a bite. They beat a bite. Eventually, the whole caterpillar was finished. And everybody ate. If there was any house group, I was closed because I was in that church for two weeks. was that house group. We somehow had unbelievable contact. And at the end of the day, when I was leaving the house group, I mean, there was so much talk. After all the caterpillars, we prayed together. I shared prayer needs from Zambia. We prayed, and then my host took me back home. That was enough fellowship. Now, it was around Caterpillar, and it was amazing. There was high five. We saw how people get scared. We saw how people laugh. We saw how others taste food for the first time. Others were intrigued that this pastor is teaching us how to cook. He's from Africa, purely teaching us Africa, and fellowship went on. And they do that often. I'm not saying we adopt that if we did, praise the Lord, but I'm just giving an example of practical things. Then the next house group which I went to, which was the following week, uh, for them, they asked me, what can we do to participate? We've been praying as a house group, and one of our prayer uh, items has been, how can we participate in missions in Africa? We know, yes, our church gives funding to particular missionaries who are in Africa and other worlds, but we as a house group, we want to do a one-time activity. What is it that we can do? And at that time, I said, 
well, literature is a great need. And you know what that house group said? That answers our question. We will provide ESV study Bibles to whomever you want to give in Zambia. So I said, no, I will go and give pastors in outskirts who may not have a library, but they will benefit from a study Bible. And so they gave me, they raised money to buy 30 ESV Bibles, which were difficult to carry. I came back to Zambia, they shipped them over, and I gave them to particular pastors from Northwestern province, and I sent a report to say, pastors have received and they're excited. And we took a few pictures to show that I was giving, it's not just written. And that was just a house group, and they did, that was a one-time activity. They didn't say they'll always buy, they just did a one-time special activity, raised money, bought Bibles for these Af uh, Zambian pastors from Northwestern where they cannot afford a library, and it was a blessing and joy to them. So dear friends, those are some of the practicalities we want to see among us as house group. Uh, in our discussion prior to this, as I was discussing with my brother in the vehicle, and one of the things that came up, which is a good and interesting thing. Have you ever thought about what makes Catholicism thrive? Obviously, when we think of the watchtowers, we think of their door-to-door -door effort. But have you ever thought about the Catholics or the UCZ? But let me stick to Catholic illustration. Have you ever noticed how their Ichitente concept is quite a big thing. Have you ever noticed that? You know the each tente thing, eh? They meet every Sunday afternoon to have each tente. Now, whatever they do, we may not agree with it and some of the things could be wrong, but here's the, what I'm trying to pick from there. In a sense, they practice biblical fellowship. They may fellowship around beer or around music, whatever they do, in terms of particular things they do, that's not my issue here. My borrowing is the concept that once every week they will meet if it's around a meal, if it's whatever they do, but what makes them thrive is the chitente thing. Do you know that the Catholic priest will not come to your funeral when you die if you are not participating in each chitente? They will even send a report Chitente attendance new. Okay, to menko kampenga. Okay, they want. Now, obviously, we would not go that direction. But here's my point. There are little house groups or chitentes. That's what, that's the word for house group. Those chitentes or tents or tutis, wherever they meet, has made them exercise a certain level of unity because of what those do which make up the church family. We can do much greater we who have the truth or who claim to have the right teaching. Well, let me stop right there. And I hope this makes quite a bit of sense as we look forward to next year that we need to get out of our comfort zone where all we do is show up on a, sun, on a Tuesday, sit and wait for the one to teach us. And even when he's teaching, he asks a question, we are blank. And then he begins to say, I'll start mentioning names. You know, it's a house group. I'll start mentioning names. And everybody looks down at Kutubakusonta. And then Chitente comes to an end. Who? How was your Chitente? No, that's not the point, dear friends. We can do far much better. We can become more biblical. We can have our lives touching our lives for Christ. We can reach out to the community. We can initiate projects within the church. A house group can say, you know what, the music system is struggling, sound system, we as a house group, what can we do?
to make the sound be much better. Oh no, we've heard that we need to have that building there finished. We as a house group, we want to buy the glasses. Who's in charge? How can we do it as a house group? And that is being done above and beyond our tithes and offerings. At times we fear adopting financial projects at the church and sorry to say, forgive us as elders and deacons, we are the problem most of the time because we are so jealous of the Sunday offerings and so we, want, we don't even want to allow you to adopt a project. In our sinful thinking, we think if you adopt that project, you'll be getting your tithe towards that project. No, we should trust you so much that you are believers who know very well that I will tithe, but I will also give above and beyond my tithes and offerings. And so if a house group says, look, we are going to adopt this activity in the church, we want to make this look beautiful, we want to change this so long the proper channels are followed, that is not unbiblical. That is, in fact, more biblical for a house group that we fellowship around that effort and see this done in the church, see this done in the life of someone. Right now, we have a few individuals in the church who are not well. So for example, Auntie Petronella, Mr. Simoa, and a few other elder, elderly people in the church that are not well or are looking up. At the house group level, we can say, you know what? What can we do? You know, we know this mother has not been well for such a long time. House group, what is this one blessing? Maybe once in a while or for a certain period of time, let's encourage this mother. Let's go around this brother. Uh, Mr. Simoa and his current situation. And the house group in where he belongs, we say, you know what? Let's host his birthday party. On his birthday, we'll all go there. Ladies, prepare the cake. Men, prepare the juice. Prepare him a small gift. Let's take him a shirt. Let's take him whatever we can. And let's just be a blessing to that home and just go there, sit, have a nice time, and sing happy birthday to him. Auntie Petronella, same thing. Here is a mother who has been in pain for a very long time. Let's bring a certain joy to her life. As a house group, what is this one thing? Let's celebrate her birthday. Let's take care of this. Those are some of the practical efforts you can do. When such is happening, I can tell you, the unity, the togetherness, like the Bible is saying here in Acts, will be real among us. I pray that encourages your soul. Amen? Before I call Crispin to return and close us in prayer, is there a thought, a question that you may have and say, I'm thinking, I'm provoked, what about this or that? Anything? Yes. Please go ahead. Mm -hmm. That is on in church. Visitors on Sunday. Okay. Thank you. That's a very good idea. I know you didn't hear at the back. This is the direction we're taking. In fact, we've already said that every Sunday a house group is responsible for both morning and evening service in terms of hospitality, welcoming our visitors and attending to the general needs. Among the elders, one of the things I'll preempt a little is we've been thinking of how can the whole ushering be handled by not just a hospitality team, but the house group, okay? As part of our initiative to draw in those who come among us. So this morning, the 
example given there was a family that came in much late but they came in after we introduced visitors and there was a group of almost eight and that was overwhelming for the house group or the hospitality team. A house group can say, we will make sure we are always there. Either we are on duty or not on duty. But if we are on duty, as a house group, this Tuesday we are meeting and just discuss how we can handle church service. And then when Sunday comes or our duty comes, men and women, we are there greeting, we are there welcoming, we are there, in fact, talking to our visitors, perhaps even sharing the gospel. That is a great idea. So house groups, please don't forget that to be one of your efforts. Any other question, addition, follow-up? Men? I'd appreciate to hear one or two men. Yes. That's true. So the idea is, for example, like we are saying, the group that is on duty, Chitente, or house group, the visitors have come, that house group is making the initiative to eventually follow up, eventually lead them into the whole process until they come and present them to the elders and say they are applying for membership. Okay? Yes? Now, he put a disclaimer. He's not saying that's what we're adopting. Okay. Elder. church. That's very true. By the way, church, be ready. Sooner than later, this church, we are going to shrink. And the only reason we're going to shrink is across Ring Road. We have over 40 members of our church live across Ring Road. That's a time we should be thinking of planting a church there. Amen? Uh-uh. Amen? Okay. <laughs> we should be thinking about that. that. When that time comes, and it's going to come faster than we think, a church must be born that side. We can't have 70% of the church comes from Ring Road, and 30% or 20% comes from across, and 5% comes from Yumbayang. Take the church where the, people, the community is. That doesn't sound good, eh? No, if we need to activate that for nothing. No, God wants to grow his church. And if we can go and influence elsewhere, it's important. Okay? Yes, Uncle Ray. That is a great reminder. We need to make that practical. Thank you very much. Unless there is one burning, yes, uh, our.
Yeah, that's, that's a worthy thought. Um, the only challenge is we've already suffered from COVID and everybody can't wait. So when we go that route, again, it will be a heavy weight. But I, I appreciate and understand very well. Um, you know, it's a proposal. However, we thought January, if we all get on the ground, we may not begin with so much enthusiasm. And it may not even work from the very start. But I think the idea is if we are all going this direction as we go on, like what you've identified, those failures, those challenges will come and we'll meet with the house group leaders, talk about them, see how we're doing. Before long, the assumption is we'll eventually get there. It may take longer, we will fail, and the, the room for failure is there, but uh, let's try it. Let's try it. Um, right now, we've had one house group that had been running virtually, and we said everybody take advantage to go in that house group virtually, and it has not happened. Um, very few have bothered to go in there. So we felt the more we break it down to smaller groups, probably there will be a heavy contact and there will be some driving of one another to get there. But that proposal is worth uh, taking. Thank you very much. Is there anybody else? Comment, thought, follow up? All right, so I pray that uh, this direction will be, will be something that we will think. And my last statement is, please let's try to think outside the box of the tradition we've always created around our school and become more biblical by being more creative and thoughtful and engaging other things for the sake of us to fellowship, break bread, and grow together as a church.